Given that energy cannot be created or destroyed, does it not make sense that our essence, or soul, continues after our physical death, and can reincarnate to continue the necessary learning process to advance our understanding of the universe and what might be outside it? In short, do you believe in reincarnation? And would you please elaborate on why you do or do not? That's from James. So, I mean, before I just want to sort of understand where you're coming from here, because you, it seems like you're making a case for reincarnation. You know, energy can't be created or destroyed. Um, and so you would, I guess you're putting the soul in the category of energy, uh, and therefore, since it can't be created or destroyed, it must be eternal. Um, and also, you seem to say that there's a necessary learning process that occurs in the universe. I wonder if you could just elaborate on those two ideas first. Thank you. Okay. Basically, um, because, you know, as so you've said in a lot of your videos, you know, as philosophy is important because, you know, having ethical standards uh, ultimately makes, you know, life life better and is kind of makes it a, a more, you know, uh, and basically a more worthwhile process for all of us. So I guess what I imagine at least um, life to be is essentially a, um, a school that essentially we all attend in order to develop that, uh, to develop a, sta a standard of ethics and to develop uh, essentially, I guess, a, a state of fearlessness so that you can uh, take on, take on, I guess, experiences without uh, backing down and then also, uh, also learn to have compassion for all living things, um, which ultimately I think is a graduation process that continues uh, where basically you are you're giving more, given more and more energy or more power um, through an incarnation to do more, um, and then basically recombining with uh, <laughs> whatever the source of everything is, um, and then maybe possibly starting the whole process all over again. So, so basically, yes, I am making a case that there's, I think there's a good chance that that is why we're all here. Uh, that's why we essentially suffer, or at least experience suffering, and. And I guess yeah. I, I hopefully does that does that kind of uh, point it out a little bit better or? It, yeah, it's one of these answers that raises many more questions than than it, it answers, definitely. so to speak. So is it is 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 this directed by a god? This this learning, this eternal recurrence. Uh, I guess the way I see it is a source or a god, whatever, however you'd want to see it. I don't see God as I guess. Um, a, a single man, you know, white beard, but as rather uh, the source of all energy, maybe even the higher ex higher being of all of ourselves. So essentially, I imagine God uh, being everything, all powerful, uh, became bored one day, essentially, and decided to split himself up uh, into trillions and trillions and trillions of pieces, and then um, and essentially uh, go through, or I guess, forget that he is God. And then go through a process of relearning that he is um, until he does once again, and I guess you could call that the universe. And then he once again relearns that, you know, after probably trillions and trillions of years, possibly that he is God, uh, recombining all of his trillions of pieces, which I would consider us cells, you know, animals. Basically, we all combine once again, realize that we are the source, um, and then and then after enjoying that for a while you know after however long you know it took to to get back to that point he then d redoes the redoes it and then just basically experience himself completely um uh yeah basically to just uh to basically just do something rather than just be all powerful because i imagine that would get boring you know after you know af after some time so yeah basically yeah there there is a god we are all god and we are essentially um, just pieces or fragments of it that are relearning that experience and and we go through this process called life or incarnations uh, until we recombine and all right then, I got um, it I got it yeah so is this something that you have uh, come come up with or is this something that you've read this hypothesis um, you, I think I've I've come across it um, I think I've come across it in different ways um, I think it, uh, not, nothing that says it could quite uh, exactly as I'm saying it right now, but in different ways, essentially, that, yes, basically, yeah, basically, this that's, uh, you know, why we reincarnate, and, and I guess I kind of maybe kind of added a little bit of my own, <laughs> my own uh, flavor in there to try to get to that point of, 
you know, why are we here? You know, what is our purpose? Uh, where did we come from? Right, right. And how old were you when you first began thinking about this stuff? Oh, uh, uh, I, I honestly, uh, pretty young, um, uh, probably t between 10 and 12, but it didn't really come to fruition, I'd say, until I started having lucid dreams, um, probably in my late teens, where essentially I'd wake up in my dream, realize I was dreaming. And then, you know, when you wake up from that experience, it's, it's kind of a it's kind of jaw dropping because you're like, well, where was I? How was I conscious inside this dream? Because, you know, as in a dream, you know, we could say, oh, it's some chemical process, you know, maybe just I'm yeah, reordering things in my brain. Okay, and so okay. then I have you, these, you need to be yeah. a little bit more succinct. I just uh, need, need okay, I, okay. you can't give me the, the essays uh, every time I ask a question. Otherwise, I'm going to have to no, be no, thank rude you. and interrupt. And I what was there. your yeah. life like when you were 10 or, or 12, James? What was going on in your life, uh, good and bad? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, you know, essentially kind of growing up, um, you know, growing up in a large family, three younger sisters, an older brother, um, you know, playing soccer, you know, going to school, not necessarily feeling, I guess, you know, good things would be, you know, just, um, uh, I guess, having having fun with my family, bad things, not having fun with my family. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, maybe going through, I guess, anything that, you know, same kind of stuff anyone would go through, just, you know. So nothing it, unusual, it, nothing out of the ordinary. No, no, not really. And did you talk about these theories or ideas with your family? Uh, no, I did not. I didn't. I think I tried to, but it wouldn't be anything that uh, anyone would run with. So, so it wasn't anything that, uh, yeah, that I felt comfortable, I guess, talking about, you know, very often. So usually what I would, I would get it, you know, I would kind of be able to live through the process, you know, with certain movies that I enjoyed that seemed to cover certain things like that or, you know, or be interested in science and, you know, I guess well, things I, like that. I don't know that science really has come into much of what you're saying, but we'll get back to that. Okay. <laughs> and have okay. you uh, done any um, uh, any drugs or did you do any drugs during this or, or after, I guess, a little later than this time period? Or have you done sort of mind-altering substances uh, in, in your life? Yes. Late, well, later on in my late teens, uh, I did use cannabis and um, and then I've 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 tried mushrooms um, and let's see let's see and then actually yeah that's that's and then there was a I don't know if you know what that is but it's it's a DMT which is essentially um, a dimethyltryptamine which is basically um, I guess released when you dream um, and so I've tried that once but that was that was way too strong so I guess really cannabis would be the only one that I've used. Um, that would fall into that, yeah, psychotropic, yeah, kind of mind-altering state. Right. So with the cannabis and with the mushrooms, what was your frequency of use uh, and how long did it go on for? Or is it still going on? Uh, no, it's not going on anymore. But it was, uh, it was, it was fairly often. Like it was, you know, at least once a week, you know, that I was using it because, uh, you know, being a musician and also kind of having those, ex you know, in that those kind of interests, it ended up kind of falling into that because there was kind of. Um, uh, what's the word? I guess basically a comfort in that, you know, in in that experience. To be honest. So, uh, being a musician, you had to do drugs. Uh, no, no. I guess uh, what it really was was uh, I was actually pretty. Uh, I was pretty against drugs. I was a I was a soccer player, and so I was really not into it. Uh, then I joined a band. And um, a little bit of peer pressure, but, you know, obviously I make my own decisions. But anyway, a bit of peer pressure uh, ended up opening up that possibility, and I kind of uh, rolled with it. <laughs> but your belief systems and, would have also made you susceptible to this kind of experience, right? Because for you, there's another world out there beyond this world, which in point. some ways is more true, right? This disco ball exploding god that gets bored and disassembles himself and then later reassembles himself and then disassembles himself again when he gets bored and all that. So for you, there is a metaphysical, like the, the nature of reality is such that you, you don't have a sort of healthy brain that's processing reality in a normal way, just by using your senses, your reason and, and evidence and mm -hmm. stuff. There is another realm out there that you can get access to through mind-altering substances. They're not messing with a healthy motor. They're opening up a more real and deep dimension. Is that a fair way to put it? Uh, yeah, actually, that is. That's an interesting way to put it as well. Yeah. 
And this is, this is one of the problems with metaphysics that may be problematic, is that once you define another world out there, a higher plane of existence, a platonic ideal, an exploding frag god uh, of, of infinite perspectives, well, y you, you can go there. And, and it's not just that you're messing with your perceptions, it's that you're opening right, the doors of perception. Right? Is, that, is that Huxley? Anyway, it was what Jim Morrison, why, why yes, he named yes. the band The Doors, right? To go through the doors of perception. And this is why philosophy is so important. Because if you say, well, reason and evidence, evidence of the senses, that's your life working really well, that's your brain working really well, then anything which disturbs that process of accurately perceiving sensual reality, anything which disturbs that process is like taking a ball peen hammer to your elbow. <laughs> I mean, it's bad. Elbow's working well. Take a ball peen hammer to elbow, elbow not working well. And so drugs harm our perception uh, of the sensual world, of the empirical world. But if you believe that they're a tunnel through to a real higher reality, then they become a form of self-illumination rather than of self-harm. Does that make sense with your experience? Uh, I, I think so, actually. Yes, it does. Right. So whether it is a doorway to a higher realm or whether it is just screwing around with something that's working pretty well to begin with has to do with this question of this other reality. Now, the question is, what first gave you the idea of this higher reality? Where did it come from? And why was um, it compelling? I, you understand oh. you have an emotional attachment to this idea. Now, of course, you you know, the fallacy of sunk costs would say that after a decade, decade, a half or two decades, you don't have to tell me you, how old you are. But after you've made a whole bunch of life decisions, including taking mind altering drugs, because of a belief in this, you've got sunk costs, as they call it, right? Like, you've invested a lot and made some significant life decisions on the existence of this higher realm. And so you're invested, but there must be some reason at the beginning why you got this idea of the higher realm and why it resonated with you and excited you and sent you on this particular direction, if that makes sense. Uh, I think it does. And I guess I, I would really just, uh, I guess the biggest, the reason was just uh, to understand what what we are, where we go and where we came from, just uh, because I guess religion didn't seem to do it for me. Um, I, I just I didn't seem to resonate that res resonate with that, but essentially I I did. I just wanted to know where where did I come from because honestly, just physical our physical bodies didn't seem like enough um, uh, enough of an explanation of of what we were. Okay, so you felt a sense of purpose was missing, a sense of meaning was missing, yes. a, a larger story that you're a part of rather than a self generated purpose, right? So something Absolutely. outside of yourself needed to give you purpose in order for you to have purpose. You couldn't generate it yourself. You couldn't generate meaning and purpose and efficacy and power within your own life. And so do you think that this came from an idea of religion, that religion gave you an idea that you were part of a larger story, that you were imbued with purpose from a higher being, but it did not satisfy you when you got into your early teens and therefore, this idea gives you the same purpose and, of course, is a kind of religion, obviously, right? I mean, you've got a god. You can call it what you want, but it's a supernatural being. So yes, yes. do you think that religion may have made you more susceptible to this idea of this explodey disco god and this higher realm? Uh, I'd say so. You know, I'm not sure if uh, I'm not sure if I would have come to the conclusion of a god without having studied, you know, religions and and you know come across what they had, you know, what they had presented. And you know, ultimately, I guess I did kind of come to a conclusion that you know all religions seem to be right in in one way, you know, or another. You know, it's uh, I I think I don't think one really hits the nail on the head, but uh, I think they all have a piece of it. Um, and I think, you know, that, yeah, so I guess I, I, I built from that. So what for you was more satisfying with this explanation? Um, I assume we're going to raise, you were raised Christian. Is that fair to say? Uh, you, you know, not, not, not strictly, but yeah, I guess that's, you know, we went to In church the, a few I times. mean, did you go to church? Did you guys, I mean, how did that? Um, uh, I think we went to church, you know, maybe, you know, 
five times and I didn't really enjoy it very much. And then I think yeah, I'm just going to have to ask you to yeah. lean in and cup oh, again because you're getting quiet. Uh, th- so no, thank you. Yeah. So so did religion when you were growing up impose any obligations? On you, like, did you have to go help the poor? Uh, did you have to read to the blind? Did you have to tutor the ignorant? Was there anything in the religiosity within your family that gave you any obligations to society as a whole? Uh, no, no, it wasn't imposed upon me. No, I didn't ask if it was imposed upon you. Okay. But was did your parents say, well, you know, we have to give to charity because? religion or we have to go man a soup kitchen because religion or we have to take in strangers off the street because religion was there any obligation to serve society in any altruistic sense as a result of religion within your family uh well not as a result of religion but my mom you know would definitely you know impart upon all of us that it was important to be a good person to you know to do good um for others less fortunate for sure that did happen okay but it was not in a religious context for her? No, no, not at all. Uh, so who was religious then? It was your father? Uh, well, I think it was really more, we went to church a few times, mostly because I think my parents wanted to attempt to go to church because that's what you did. But neither of my parents were really raised religiously. Um, and and so I guess I, I don't think it was anything that they felt they needed to do. It was more like a sense of community that didn't end up really panning out from my understanding. I haven't really had too many conversations with them. I just remember going a few times, going to the, you know, the class with the other kids, uh, coming out, not really enjoying, you know, when I was actually sitting in the main, you know, in the main hall and listening to what was being said, just kind of thinking, well, this is really boring. So uh, there was really no push, yeah, push right. for religion like, like most And I'm people. sort of trying to understand. So you've got a sense of meaning and purpose out of this reincarnation hypothesis of yours, James. What uh, obligations yeah. has it given to you? What, what obligations has, like for me, philosophy, uh, understanding that I'm good at philosophy, good at communicating philosophy, good at talking about philosophy, good at discussing philosophy, has given me an obligation to try and bring philosophy to the world, right? So my pursuit of meaning, my pursuit of virtue, my pursuit of truth has instilled in me a pretty basic training, you know, <laughs> yelling Southern um, training sergeant uh, on me to, to sort of serve, serve the world. And I'm curious, having this sense of meaning and purpose, what obligations, if any, has it given to you in the world as a whole? Um, I guess I would say um, <laughs> to maybe try to, to try to, uh, inform people that there is a strong possibility that um, this life that you're experiencing isn't the last one, probably isn't the first, and based on how you decide to live it will affect maybe your next incarnation, you know, as the Buddhists say, with karma, you know, a, a, a accruing good karma will make your next life better, uh, bad karma, you know, worse, or maybe be, you're suffering because you're paying back karma. I guess uh, the real reason, yeah, I wanted to call in was to maybe discuss that uh, because, yeah, essentially, I think it's a good thing. I think if we understood that as a ray, or you know, as you know, as humans, we would essentially maybe uh, forego a lot of the the harm that we do to ourselves and All others. Right. And how because, yeah. uh, how many times a month or a year do you have this conversation with people, if if at all? And what kind of response well, do you yeah. get? I, I would say, um, you know, I, I used to I used to live in Boulder, Colorado. So um, that's, <laughs> Wait, so I'm sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't laugh. But you know, stereotypes and cliches do amuse me. So sorry, go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. No, and you're exactly right. So when I was there, I, I had it a bit more than I do now. I'm in the UK now, but uh, it's it. I'd say when I did have it. Um, it, it'd be maybe 50-50. Uh, some people would be open to it. Some people uh, would shut shut it down, um, which which was fine. I never tried to force th- force it upon anyone. Mostly just to uh, talk about it with people, you know, who who were actually interested. And and some I guess would kind of you know. And, and how uh, often would know, these conversations occur? Uh, I'd say once a month. Once a month. So the grand total of this obligation that this theology has given you, James, is once a month you can talk about something that you really like to talk about. 
Uh, I, I guess so you could put it Is that it safe way. to say there's not a lot of sacrifice or, or, or risk or courage that is required to pursue this higher meaning? Well, I think I think I could be more courageous and and try to do it more, but no, I haven't. I but haven't. There's had no requirement to, to do it. There's no, no obligation. There's no noblesse oblige. Like you've seen the shards of godhood floating in the higher universe, and therefore it is absolutely essential that you get people to believe in this, to accept it, to change their lives. It's kind of a self-serving yeah. story, right? It doesn't give you any kind of Socratic obligation to risk things by bringing truth to people in a world that so often hates, uh, hates or, or attacks the truth, right? Yeah, you know, and I guess, yeah, you could say it's, it's probably more of a hobby than, uh, than yeah, a job. I, <laughs> yeah, so for sure. where's the meaning? If you don't, like, if you've, if you've got access to truth and you believe that this is true and it's essential and it helps the world and it's really important for people, then aren't you just kind of whistling and strolling by an entire lagoon full of drowning people and not really wanting to get your loafers wet? Uh, you know what? I've actually I've thought of that quite a few times, and I I I think in some ways, yes, I am doing that, and that's probably out of my own fear of tripping up over myself as I try to explain, and then basically looking stupid. So um, I I do shy away from that quite a bit, and yeah, I do kind of feel like I am not uh, fulfilling fulfilling my purpose um, most of the time. Absolutely, because and I get meaning yeah. is obligation. Purpose is obligation. And people I know, the hackles around the world are going up when I say this, too bad, deal with it or turn me off. If you have the truth, guess what? You're obligated. If you have a fact, particularly if those facts or that truth or those arguments have an effect on the moral character of the world, on people's moral choices, on their happiness, on the spread of virtue in the world, you are obligated. Listen, if you're growing a plant, that cures leukemia? You don't get to stay home that much. Sorry, you gotta get your plant, you gotta put it in a bag, and you gotta go to the hospital. Because you have something powerful that cures. You can't just keep it for yourself. You can't just have a big bag of it in the basement saying, well, I guess if I ever get leukemia, I'm okay. No, once you have the truth, you have an obligation. Except, James, you have a truth that has no obligation. You have a truth that you consider powerful and that you consider essential and necessary to human virtue. The truth is we live forever. The truth that you say is that we come back to life. The truth is that the quality of our existence now, the compassion we generate, the courage we have in the fight determines how we reincarnate, what we come back with. If you keep on this way, with this powerful truth in your breast, this world-shaking, life-changing, moral-enhancing truth, and you just have fairly indifferent conversations with it a couple of times a year, what are you coming back as? That's a really good point. That's an excellent point. And honestly, um, you know, maybe that, maybe there's part of me that wanted to call in to, to hear that, you know. Um, and so yeah, I, I can't argue, yeah, argue that at all because I do, I have to agree with you and it definitely on a soul level, you know, I think I've kind of tried to have that, um, my, that same conversation with myself uh, about maybe not trying hard enough to at least convey what I do believe. So, um, yeah, so far, I, it seems to have given you a rather self-serving sense of purpose that carries with it no obligation other than to smoke a couple of doobies once in a while. You know, that, okay. that is not a very uh, soul-scarring, searing, warring, requires infinite amounts of quasi-Aristotelian courage in order to pursue. My religion is, well, it gives me a vague sense of purpose, doesn't give me any obligations in the world, and I get to smoke pot. Hmm, not the most challenging belief system in the world, but let me ask you this, James. Okay. How do you know this is true? Any of this, that what you're arguing for? Okay, uh, I, guess, I guess the only way that I, I guess there, there does seem to be some sort of, um, uh, some sort of science behind it. I don't, I'm not sure if you were able to look at the link that I had sent you when I had sent my question in, uh, but basically there is a link to, um, to uh, this web page um, kind of talking about Dr. Ian Stevenson's work, and he had gone through and basically interviewed a lot of children, and he was actually, he was, you know, a scientist, um, you know, and had published many papers before he became interested in incarnation. I think he was a psychologist of some sort. Anyway, he discovered that a lot of children 
uh, before the age of, you know, before the age of five or six were, would tell stories of past lives. And, and when he actually gave them, um, his attention, he, he was able to find a lot of these things. Like, uh, he would, they would talk about, a you know, being a certain person or being of a family. And then he would do the research about the, the people they were talking about, find them, and then find that there was consistencies, uh, in ways that these children, children shouldn't have known, whether it was from distance, um, or, you know, or, or, a lot of different factors. So basically, he, you know, being a skeptic himself, he was able to go through and find that a lot of these children would somehow remember experiences from different people that had already passed on, um, and then have certain things like, like birthmarks from, you know, where that uh, that person had been killed. Uh, now in this life, they now have a birthmark, you know, in that same place where that person was, you know, you know, uh, you know, stabbed or something like that. So he he was no, actually sorry. What was to, uh, what was the guy's name again? Uh, Doctor Ian Stevenson. Or Steven, Stevens, Stevenson, yes. Okay, go ahead. Anyway, so he, uh, yeah, essentially he, he's gone through a lot of these cases, and I guess he found a, a lot of them in India. And, you know, a lot of skeptics would say, well, you know, you're, you're, you're probably going through a lot of fraud. And he, he would agree, you know, he would agree that there probably is quite a bit of fraud that's, that's happening where people want to be, you know, people want to say, I, I was Cleopatra, blah, blah, blah. But he would actually go through and, and find that, you know, even if there were 80% of these were actually uh, fraud, the other 20%, you know, are important enough, you know, to be like, well, this deviation, that's, you know, means that we have something here. This means something. And so I guess, you know, there, there was even certain cases um, from another, another doctor. And this one's less verified, but I think it's interesting. It was Dr. Lash uh, near Syria, I guess, had uh, – there was a boy who remembered being killed – he remembered where he was buried. He remembered where the weapon was buried. He apparently, you know, he took the, the town elders to where his body was buried, found out, you know, found they, they found a body buried, then they found a weapon, and then he even knew who had killed him, and then they, and then they faced, uh, uh, they faced the, the perpetrator, and then he broke down and basically said that he had done it. Uh, this is in a book somewhere. I, I can't verify it because you know, I don't know how, don't know how, but I guess it gives the, it kind of gives, um, a little uh, uh, piece of how this this could possibly be uh, occurring, and essentially, yeah, w how how to verify it. So, if that is true, that means that we do reincarnate, or at least some souls reincarnate. And if some souls reincarnate, you know, why do they? Um, and if you know, I guess if any of them reincarnate, that shows that it's possible, um, which I think, you know, lends to the to the possibility that yes, that's what we're what we do. When we, uh, when we, basically, when we exist, you know, we we don't just live, you know, one one life and then call it quits, you know, or 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 disappear for that matter. But we continue to exist uh, beyond our physical bodies, and and then and then have other experiences afterwards. Right now, have you looked up any of the skeptical rebuttals to Stevenson's method? I, I I guess um, you know specifically I haven't gone through what, what's you know any any of his any of his um, yeah I guess it rebuttals to any of his actual information. No, I haven't gone through anything specific like that. Dude, though I have. What do you yeah. mean you haven't? Well, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Oh I, come I just, on. I guess. Come on. Well, it's you you can't you uh, can't say well I've now crossed over and I've accepted reincarnation and soul and past lives and disco gods and all of that. And I've and, and one of the this Stevenson fellow, I haven't looked up any rebuttals to anything that he came up with. Well, I'll, I'll give you a few. I'll give you a few. Okay. But this shows confirmation bias, right? That this you want this to be true, and therefore oh, you've read I, some I, of this I, stuff, and he gave you that goosebump of confirmation bias. Ooh, it's got to be true. I'll, I'll agree with you there. Okay, yes, so yes. Um, just so people understand this, right? So he worked in translators, with translators in countries, and he didn't really know much about the countries. He certainly didn't understand the language. So, you know, asking anyone is, is tough enough, but asking children is particularly tricky, right? True. Uh, a quote, interviewer bias, bias is the central driving force in the creation of suggestive interviews, right? I don't know if you remember, I think it was in the 80s, there were supposed to be all of these satanic cults operating out of daycares, and they had kids who just, oh yeah, oh, this happened and that, and so, you know. So this is a, a challenge, right? So questioning children and, 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 and adults via a translator is another level 
or another layer of, uncertain, uh, of uncertainty. Most of his interviews took places in countries where reincarnation is an accepted belief, right? So this is not a null hypothesis uh, situation. So uh, there's something called the null hypothesis, right? What is, what is the null hypothesis of this? So he said, well, I want to go out and find these past life experience stories and confirm them. And so let's say he got rumors or heard about a past life experience story and could not confirm it. So there was, and what does that mean? Does that mean it's false? No, it just means he goes on to the next one and he collects a whole bunch of them and says, ah, this is the case. So what could he ever experience or interview or what information could he gather that would disconfirm this reincarnation hypothesis? Well, nothing. And therefore, there's no null hypothesis and therefore it is all confirmation bias, right? There are, of course, alternative non-paranormal explanations for uh, his, his data, right? And so critics can say, well, children's fantasies like imaginary playmates and so on are to some degree shaped by parents and peers through questions and suggestions. Uh, they, you hear as a kid, of course, stories about people who died or crimes in the village or things like that. So this can all um, be uh, reemerge during these kinds of, uh, of questions. And um, so this is, um, is a problem, right? He, he, he's working with translators in cultures that already believe in reincarnation. He himself wants to believe that this is true and children in, are generally very keen on pleasing authority figures and so they're going to cough up information that's going to be in confirmation with what the authority uh, figures want and um, what's, the, um, uh, what's the point? Uh, he, he wanted this to be true. He went in and interviewed people and then he wrote, wrote it up knowing very clearly we know that he wanted all of this to be true. And that is... Um, not a credible basis by which we can think that reincarnation is somehow proven. Uh, he himself admitted he hadn't provided compelling evidence for reincarnation. And um, that, is, uh, uh, that is important, right? So one of the things he noticed was that reincarnation stories tended to revolve around violent deaths rather than peaceful deaths. Well, because they leave more of an imprint in the psyche of the sort of collective psyche uh, of the family. Um, violent deaths are more likely to be reported in the media, retold in stories uh, across the, the sort of local region and so on. And so the chances that a child is going to hear about that kind of violent story, uh, as opposed to uh, peaceful stories, is, is much, um, much more likely that that's going to, uh, to happen. And older children and adults, he found, generally forget what they reported uh, as as children, and so it is. Uh, it, this is, I mean, this is a crazy guy. It's a crazy hobby. This is nothing to do with scientific proof. Uh, and of course, he took a lot of mind altering drugs himself. And um, well, that might have an impact on one's dedication to rational objectivity. So, um, but but of course, you wanted to believe it. He wanted to believe it. So this is not. This is not why you believe, right? That you didn't sort of have a neutral opinion and be really, really impressed with the Stevenson Fellows' dedication to the scientific method. Um, you, you wanted to believe, and so you grabbed something, you know, like a drowning belief, as like a drowning man just grabs at whatever it can to stay afloat. And so you grabbed at this stuff in order to confirm your own pre-existing beliefs. And that is a, uh, uh, a real shame. Now either because he didn't like where this is going or because he's got a bad connection, we have tragically lost the James. But I will tell you um, what I think about reincarnation. It's false. It's, it's not even like maybe true. It's false. We do not have a soul. We do not come back to life. We are magic meat. <laughs> the only magic is consciousness, which we have yet to fully understand, and which we may, of course, never uh, fully understand. And um, so, no, I don't believe in reincarnation uh, at, at all. Uh, I don't have any memories of past lives. There's no evidence that people have any memories of past lives. There's anecdotes, which, you know, and there's children being questioned in foreign languages by guys who've done lots of drugs, and that's all nonsense. We can't possibly have that as a standard 
of belief. Now, why did we take this call? Why did I want to take this call? Well, for a number of reasons. Number one, I am sick and tired, so sick and goddamn tired of people masturbating their little belief systems that provide no obligation for them whatsoever. You know, the world is in a dangerous place. The world is kind of in a crisis right now. And people mucking about with, am I going to come back as a dung beetle or a phoenix is bullshit. Get off your ass, put down your bong and do something to save the world because it bloody well needs it right now. I am sick and tired of this meism, this vague kind of mystical, otherworldly, other reality. You don't have to help the poor. You don't have to tutor the ignorant. You don't have to heal the sick. You don't even have to shovel anyone's goddamn driveway. All you have to do is take a hit, listen to some Floyd and think about crystals in another dimension that could be you in another life, in another set of circumstances. Oh, man. It's lazy, it's self-indulgent, it's boring, it's bullshit. And let me tell you something, when it comes up, when this meism, this flaccid, oh, I get meaning with no obligation, I get purpose with, no action, with not actually having to do a goddamn thing, when this vague, fuzzy, cloudy, self-worshipping, self-excusing, do-nothing bullshit, when it runs up against a relatively muscular belief system like Islam, well... I don't think it's going to last very long at all. So I'm sick and tired of this stuff. Stop trying to get meaning from bullshit. Stop trying to get purpose from a cloud of marijuana smoke. For God's sakes, shake it off, people. (coughs) Snap out of it. Shake it off. You know, you're inheriting freedoms from people who didn't get them by hitting the bong at every conceivable opportunity. What are you, Nick and freaks and geeks? For God's sakes, stop air drumming. Stop staring at your lava lamps and listening to Moog synthesizers in the dark, for God's sakes. Wake up. Snap out of it. This is the life you have. Nothing else. Nothing else is coming. No afterlife. No resurrection. No reincarnation. No heaven. No hell. Nothing is coming. What you have is now. What you have is today. What you have is breath. In and out and in and out. And you know what that means? That's two less that you have to live. It may be grains of sand on a beach. It may be logs in a pile. It may be four more you don't even know. You might have as many breaths left as legs of a spider. That's all you're going to get. All you're going to get is what you make, what you reason, what you think, and what you will what you will. Nothing outside is going to bungee in and give you meaning. Nothing outside is going to bungee in and excuse you for pitifully wasting your life. Nothing and no one is coming to make everything better, to make it all right, to make it all work out for the best. You know who's coming? (laughs) Let me tell you who's coming. Who's coming is bad people who want to rule over you. And you can snort all the crap you want to short circuit your brain and you can stare at disco lights through a chandelier. It will not stop one bad person from putting his boot or heel on your fucking neck. Not one person will be stopped by your deluded fantasies of otherworldly escapism. It's cowardly. It's ridiculous. It's embarrassing. It's retarded. And I apologize for that. That is an insult to retarded people. So that's why I asked, how do you know any of this is true? And the answer is you don't. But it serves your distraction and it serves your avoidance and it serves your emptiness. It serves your laziness and it serves your cowardice. You know, we're up here on the wall trying to save the world. You know what we need? We don't need people bullshitting about gods who disassemble themselves and then reassemble themselves in shards of bullshit. It's not what we need right now. What we need is hardy souls up here, polishing the rhetorical weapons and handing us the intellectual ammo. That's what we need up here. Because the hordes are coming from within and from without. We need to fight. And I'm sick and tired of people masturbating these stupid fantasies and thinking that they're doing anything to help the world. All they're doing is excusing themselves 
for squandering the gifts that were handed to them by much, much tougher people. So shake it off, step out of the smoke, and help us on the wall, for God's sakes.